Hey friends, welcome back. Let's chat about all the books that I have hauled recently. I'm currently getting over a sickness. Was it food poisoning? Was it just a stomach bug? I don't know. I don't really know anything. <laughs> I am not at 100%, but we're going to get through about 30 books that I have gotten recently, either from Half Price Books, Barnes & Noble, local indies, as well as a couple of gifts as well. So let's get going. <laughs> We'll start with this cute little stack. One of my patrons, Christy, sent me The Mountain in the Sea by Ray Naylor. I love this cover a lot and these edges, I didn't know that they were gonna be like that, so that was really exciting. It says, it is a near future thriller, a meditation on the nature of consciousness and an ecological call to arms. Quite a few of my patrons have told me that they think I would like this one and I am inclined to believe them. I'm really excited to pick this up. It says it's like a mind blowing dive into the treasure and wreckage of humankind's legacy. So it definitely sounds like it's going to bring in some more serious topics as well with this sort of like octopus thriller. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. Then of course I purchased for myself Done and Dusted by Lila Sage. These covers are the most iconic ones I've seen in a very long time. I don't know a single thing about it. I know it's a Western romance. <laughs> The tagline is, she's off limits, but he's never been good at following the rules. Small town brother's best friend romance. Wow, what a time to be alive. That's all I need to know. I'm really excited about it. This is also the book club pick for my book club next month in April. So if you wanna read this along with the best group of bookworms in the world, you might wanna check out my Patreon link down in the description. We would love to have you. Then I also got myself Mary by Nat Cassidy. Look at this cover. Look at that like hand coming out of the tub. Ooh, I'm so excited. <laughs> I have never read this synopsis. I have been told that I would like it because of the type of horror that it is. And the little blurb, it says, Nat Cassidy's debut horror novel, Mary, blends Midsummer with elements of American Psycho and a pinch of I'll Be Gone in the Dark. Listen, Midsummer's like my favorite movie ever, not ever, but it is up there. It is one of my favorite movies. And that blended with American Psycho, like, come on. <laughs> it's gotta be absolutely wild. I really wanna read this. I also got myself Tia Williams' new book, A Love Song for Ricky Wild. Loved Seven Days in June. It was in my top 10 of whatever year it came out. Last year, the year before. I don't know. I know I love her writing and all of the more like serious things that she brings into her storytelling. It's not all cute, fluffy romance. It, it is that, but it is also more like deep and emotional in other ways as well. And I just really love it. This is her new book. It's set in the backdrop of contemporary Harlem in 1920s decadence. It's a modern fairy tale of two passionate artists drawn to the magic and romance of New York and whose lives are irreversibly linked. Really excited about it. <laughs> then I got Behind You is the Sea by Susan Wadi Draj. I loved the quote at the top by Brandon Hobson. It says, told in rich, lush prose, this propulsive and beautiful novel will stay with me for a long time. Like if anything's described as having like rich, lush, or even like poetic prose, like I am so inclined to pick it up. It says this book faces stereotypes about Palestinian culture head on, shifting perspective to weave a complex social fabric replete with weddings, funerals, broken hearts, and devastating secrets. All of that sounded directly up my alley, was really excited to pick it up. Then we got a little bit thrifty. Caleb and I went to a library book sale. The first one that I got is The Name of All Things by Jen Lyons. This is book two. The first book is, I don't even know if I own it. Ruin of Kings, it's that one. <laughs> Do I have it? Yeah, I do. It's over there. It's over It's over there. I have it. <laughs> so why would I not get the second book for like $5? On the back, there's like Praise for Ruin of Kings, which is the first book. And it says, it's everything an epic fantasy should be. Rich, cruel, gorgeous, brilliant, enthralling, and deeply, deeply satisfying. I'm always looking for a new fantasy series to become my whole personality. And this one could be it. The next two, I don't really know anything about. This one was just a cute little square book. It says it's Ghost Stories by Sarah Moss. And I love the cover. Thought it was really pretty. It says, it's a feminist fable, mythic and timely. It asks, how far have we come from the primitive minds of our ancestors? It's about Sylvie and her family living north of England as if they were in the Iron Age. Sylvie's father raised her in stories of, of early peoples, taken her to witness rare artifacts, recounted time and time again of their rituals and beliefs, particularly their sacrifices to the bog. The ancients built ghost walls to ward off enemy invaders, rude barricades of stakes topped with ancestral skulls. When the group builds one of their own, they find a spiritual connection to the past. What comes next? How far will they go to conjure this elusive history? I just thought that it looked kind of cute and I like there's like little illustrations within the chapter headers. I saw that Maggie O'Farrell blurbed it on the back as well and I, I don't know, it was, it was like three dollars. Of course I got it. This one sounds bananas. I know nothing about this series but it is a Welcome to Night Vale novel and since I have gotten this I talked with my patrons on one of our reading sprint days and apparently this is like a well-known either podcast or book series or I don't know which one came first but this one is The Faceless old woman who secretly lives in your house. <laughs> 
by Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner. The inside, super fun. Like, it just sounds so wild. It says, in the town of Nightvale, there's a faceless old woman who secretly lives in everyone's home, but no one knows how she got there or where she came from until now. Interspersed throughout a present day story in Nightvale as the faceless old woman guides, haunts, and sabotages a man named Craig. <laughs> By the end, her dealings with Craig and her swashbuckling history in 19th century Europe will come together in the most unexpected, horrifying way. If the word swashbuckling is used, I'll probably pick it up. And like, poor Craig, why Craig? <laughs> like, I don't know, it just sounds hilarious. I don't know, I got it. Then, this one I was really excited to see. I have heard really great things about it. It is Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Coopersmith. This one says, two young women go missing decades apart. Both are fearless, both are lost, and both will have their revenge. We're following a teenage daughter of a wealthy Vietnamese family in 1986 who loses her way in an abandoned rubber plantation while fleeing her angry father. And then we follow a young, unhappy Vietnamese American woman in 2011 who disappears from her new home in Saigon without a trace. The fates of these two women are inescapably linked. This book is part puzzle, part revenge tale, and part ghost story. The book takes us from colonial mansions to ramshackle zoos to sweaty nightclubs and the jostling seats of motorbikes, from expat flats to sizzling back alley street carts. Spanning more than 50 50 years of Vietnamese history and barreling towards an unforgettable conclusion. This is a time-traveling, heart-pounding, border-crossing fever dream of a novel that will haunt you long after the last page. This is the type of story that I know that I could like, and it also helps that I have heard good things about it. I was really excited to see it sitting there. Next, I was at Barnes & Noble. I got Evil Eye by Yitaf Room. This book was a contender to read on the video I did where I read Booktuber's best books of 2023. It didn't quite make the upper levels of that list, but when I saw it at Barnes & Noble, especially with a 50% off sticker, I was obviously walking out with it. This one sounds like it really could be like a deep emotional read for me. Our main character is Yara. She is ensconced in suburban North Carolina and has achieved everything she aspired to. She's a highly educated and teaches art at a local college. She's also a wife and a mother raving two precious daughters with her businessman husband, Fady. She knows her life is worlds better than her mother's with the kind of freedom her mother had only ever dreamed of. So why doesn't it feel that way most days? Why does Yara experience flashes of anger out of nowhere or a sadness she can't name? When an incident at the college threatens Yara's job and peace of mind, her mother suggests that a family curse could be to blame. While Yara doesn't believe in old superstitions, she wonders if an evil eye may be at work. Shaken to her core, Yara finds her carefully constructed world beginning to implode. To save herself, she must finally confront the childhood she thought she'd left behind and forge her own path forward. Yara is obviously going to have to go through a lot of like reflective self-work and I think that that is a really powerful thing to witness and read about and in turn could also help heal a reader when they're going through it with the character. I think it sounds really good and I'm excited to pick it up. <laughs> okay, was this one a cover by? Yes. The Berry Pickers by Amanda Peters. Hello? This is such a stunning book. I will hear nothing else of it. Plus, I know it's set in Maine, all right? You know me in Maine. I love a coast, all right? This one says, in July 1962, following in the tradition of indigenous workers from Nova Scotia, a Mi'kmaq family arrives in Maine to pick blueberries for the summer. Weeks later, four-year-old Ruthie, the family's youngest child, vanishes. She is last seen by her six-year-old brother, Joe, sitting on a favorite rock at the edge of a berry field. Joe will remain distraught by his sister's disappearance for the years to come. In Maine, a young girl named Norma grows up the only child of an affluent family. Her father is emotionally distant, her mother frustratingly overprotective. Norma is often troubled by reoccurring dreams and visions that seem more like memories than imagination. As she grows older, Norma slowly comes to realize there is something her parents aren't telling her. Unwilling to abandon her intuition, she will spend decades trying to uncover this family secret. My mind is already cultivating like what plot twists this is gonna have. I'm already trying to figure out this plot. It seems more like a literary thriller, like it's gonna be like a slow burn thriller, not like a pedal to the metal sort of thing. And I like those, though I also do like the other ones too. I like a lot. I like reading and I'm excited to read this one. Listen, also 50% off, also one that I've been eyeing for probably six months or so, The Guest by Emma Klein. Truly what made me buy it was the little quote that's on the inside of the dust jacket. It says, Alex drained her wine glass, then her water glass. The ocean looked calm, a black darker than the sky. A ripple of anxiety made her palms go damp. It seemed suddenly very tenuous to believe that anything would stay hidden and that she could successfully pass from one world to another. I love it. I love it. If I am correct, which I hope I am, I remember seeing Jack Edwards talk about this book, I think. <laughs> 
saying that it is about this girl that is just a guest. I think for a week or so, like she's just staying in many different places. Yeah, I think I'm right. She stays on Long Island and drifts like a ghost through the hedge lanes, gated driveways, and sun-blasted dunes of a rarefied world that is at first close to her. Propelled by a desperation and immutable sense of morality, she spends the week leading up to Labor Day, moving from one place to the next. Okay, I am right. Very cool. <laughs> Though she is a cipher, leaving destruction in her wake. So I think she's gonna be like a very complicated main character. We're like a love to hate her sort of thing, potentially. But I just love the cover. I love hands. Like I, there's a lot this book has going for it. This one I'm really, really excited about. I am a little bit scared of the cover. I think it's a little creepy. It is Northwoods by Daniel Mason. It's just a little bit weird. It says it is a sweeping novel about a solitary house in the woods of New England, told through the lives of those who inhabit it across the centuries, a daring moving tale of memory and fate. It says, when two young lovers abscond from a Puritan colony, little do they know that their humble cabin in the woods will become the home of an extraordinary succession of human and non-human characters alike. An English soldier destined for glory abandons the battlefields of the new world to devote himself to growing apples. A pair of spinster twins navigate war and famine, envy and desire. A crime reporter unearths an ancient mass grave only to discover that the earth refuses to give up its secrets. A lovelorn painter, a sinister con man, a stalking panther, a lusty beetle. As the inhabitants confront the wonder and mystery around them, they begin to realize that the dark, raucous, beautiful past is very much alive. I think it sounds lovely, even a little bit strange. And if that doesn't describe my reading taste, I don't know what does. Then I decided, since I've loved everything by this author, I might as well get her backlist and I got Fable by Adrienne Young. It had very pretty blue sprayed edges and at half price books, I also found Namesake, the other, the other one, the matching one. So we got both of these, one at Barnes and Noble, one at half price books. I think that this is one that gets mixed reviews and I don't read a lot of YA anymore, but it really does sound like I could really enjoy it. So welcome to a world made dangerous by the sea and by those who wish to profit from it, where a young girl must find her place and her family while trying to survive a world built for men. So our main character is Fable. It's been four years since she watched her mother drown during an unforgiving storm. The next day, her father abandoned her on a legendary island filled with thieves and little food. To survive, she must keep to herself, learn to trust no one, and rely on the unique skills her mother taught her. The only thing that keeps her going is the goal of getting off the island, finding her father, and demanding her rightful place beside him and his crew. To do so, Fable enlists the help of a young trader named West to get her off the island and across the narrows to her father. But her father's rivalries and the dangers of his trading enterprise have only multiplied since she last saw him. And Fable soon finds that West isn't who he seems. <gasps> Together, they will have to survive more than the treacherous storms that haunt the Narrows if they are going to stay alive. I, I just love it. I love how it sounds. I really do. And like, this is so pretty. Wow, so pretty. I'm really excited about it. And it's very rare that I'm really excited about a YA anymore, but I'm into it. I think the last one from Barnes & Noble is The Beasting by Paul Murray. I just, there's something about a big book, all right? There's something about it that I'm just immediately drawn to it. And I'm very excited about how this one sounds. It says, the Barnes family is in trouble. Dickie's once lucrative car business is going under, but Dickie is spending his days in the woods, building an apocalypse-proof bunker with a renegade handyman. His wife, Imelda, is selling off her jewelry on eBay and half-heartedly dodging the attention of fast-talking cattle farmer Big Mike, while their teenage daughter, Cass, formerly top of her class, seems determined to binge drink her way through her final exams. As for 12-year-old PJ, he's on the brink of running away. If you wanted to change the story, how far back would you have to go? To the infamous bee sting that ruined Imelda's wedding day? To the car crash one year before Cass was born? Or all the way back to Dickie? at 10 years old, standing in the summer garden with his father, learning how to be a real man. I feel like that's a really good synopsis in a, like giving us little glimpses of what the story could involve without really telling us what's going on. <laughs> like, obviously this is going to be like a family saga type story. We're following all these different main characters and their problems, their issues that they have faced throughout their whole lives. I'm guessing it's going to be multi POV and it definitely sounds like it could hit some really heavy topics just from what I'm assuming of what's going on within that synopsis. So um, I love those types of stories. I have heard really good praise for this book in particular. I saw a interview with Paul Murray and it made me even more inclined to pick it up. I didn't see it until after I purchased the book, but now I'm even more excited. Next, we went to Half Price Books and we got quite a few. First, I got a memoir called Stay True by Hua Zhu. Was immediately drawn to the cover. I've seen this a couple times in the wild before. And the last time I finally saw it, I was like, okay, fine, fine, I'll get it. I love that there's actual like photographs. 
love a little mixed media moment. But like I said, it's a memoir and it's told from the eyes of 18 year old Hua Su. And he said, the problem with Ken is that he is exactly like everyone else. Ken, whose Japanese American family has been in the United States for generations is mainstream. Hua is the son of Taiwanese immigrants. He makes zines and haunts Bay Area indie record shops. The only thing Hua and Ken have in common is that however they engage with it, American culture doesn't seem to have a place for either of them. Despite his first impressions, Hua and Ken become friends, a friendship built on the successes and humiliations of everyday college life. And then violently, senselessly, Ken is gone, killed in a carjacking. Determined to hold on to all that was left of one of his closest friends, his memories, Hua turned to writing. Stay True is, is a coming of age story that details both the ordinary and extraordinary, a bracing memoir about growing up and about moving through the world in search of meaning and belonging. Obviously it's going to be a little bit heavy, but I'm prepared to cry. Next is a classic. Who is she? Who is she? It is The Count of Monte Cristo. It's like almost in perfect condition. The spine is not broken, like hardly at all. It is massive, over 1200 pages long. Um, I just, I don't know. <laughs> Many of my patrons are actually just buddy reading this book together and they're all liking it. And so I've been just like mildly on the hunt for it. You know, if I, if I found it ever, I'd probably buy it. And this was obviously $8 at half price books. And I was like, okay, fine. It's calling to me. Um, here it is. <laughs> the Count of Monte Cristo. It's an epic tale of wrongful imprisonment, adventure, and revenge. And it's a definitive translation. Then we got The Night Ship by Jess Kidd. I just really loved this cover. Oh my God. And the sprayed edges. Hello. And then I will say, I think I love a multi-timeline because when I open up a dust jacket and I see like two bolded like years, I am immediately more interested. Because in my mind, if there's a story that has multiple timelines, it can be an amazing way to push the story forward. Because, you know, as soon as you get to a climax in one of the years, then you go to the next chapter and it is the other year. So it's a little bit maddening, but like then you really want to keep reading to get back to that other timeline to see what's going on. You know, I think if it's done well, I really like it. It says one shipwreck, two misfits, three centuries apart. In 1629, we're following a new newly orphaned girl named Macon, bound for the Dutch East Indies in the Batva, one of the greatest ships in the Dutch Golden Age. Curious and mischievous, Macon spends a long journey going on misadventures above and below the deck, searching for a mythical monster. But the true monsters might be closer than she thinks. <laughs> in 1989, a lonely boy named Gil, who, after the death of his mother, is sent to live with his grandfather, a taktern fisherman off the coast of Western Australia, among the members of the seasonal fishing community where his late mother once lived. There on the tiny reef shredded island, he discovers the story of an infamous shipwreck. They're intertwined. <laughs> Would you have guessed it? That's so funny. I think I had that exact reaction when I read the synopsis in Half Price Books, but I have forgotten already that that was what this was about. I think it sounds great. Then I got Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson. I don't know anything about it. I just know Haley read it and she liked it. <laughs> So of course, when it's at half price books, you're getting a deal. You're losing money if you're not buying it that day. So I bought it. This one says, Darlie, the eldest daughter in the well-connected old money Stockton family, followed her heart, trading her job for her inheritance for motherhood, but giving up far too much in the process. Sasha, a middle-class New England girl, has married into the Brooklyn Heights family and finds herself cast as the outsider. And Georgiana, Georgiana, the baby of the family, has fallen in love with someone she can't have and must decide what kind of person she wants to be. It says it follows like New York's one person centers and that it's an escapist book that sparkles with wit. I think at my core, I am a character driven person. Like the plot also has to be good, but if I don't like the characters, I find it very hard to enjoy the book. Not even like, I don't have to like them. If the, it, the characters have to be well developed I, is what I mean. And I feel like this sounds like a character driven story, obviously. So hopefully I enjoy them or the writing. Next is another book that my patrons have told me in the past that I would really like. I've had it in multiple tabs in my computer before and I just haven't pulled the trigger to buy Buy them. So finding it at half price books, I was really excited because obviously I bought it. It is A Natural History of Dragons, a memoir by Lady Trent by Marie Brennan. I have the synopsis on Goodreads that I'm going to act like I'm reading from the back of the book. Never mind, that synopsis was confusing. Basically, we have a lady named Lady Trent, and she has done research on dragons, putting her own flesh and bone at risk because obviously dragons are powerful and probably scary. And now here at last, in her own words, is the true story of a pioneering spirit and her thrilling expedition to the perilous mountains of Viastra, where she made the first of many heroic discoveries that would change the world forever. So I wonder if this is going to be sort of like a journal entry sort of style. Ooh, it has like little illustrations within it as well. It's kind of of fun that it's like a fiction book, but is told in a memoir sort of way. And I love dragons. So I am excited to pick it up. This next one, listen, I don't remember if I've been told that the book
book is better than the movie or vice versa, but this edition was really pretty. So I got Practical Magic by Alice Hoffman. I have yet to read it. I don't really know anything about it other than it is a cozy witchy time. It's damn near a classic at this point. Am I right? It was just so beautiful. So I picked it up and maybe I will read it this fall season. This next one is a cute little thriller, which I'm just gonna peel this off. It's already basically off. Sign Here by Claudia Lux. This one sounds like the writing style is going to be like a little bit funny, a little bit like tongue in cheek in a way. It says Peyote Trip has a pretty good gig in the deals department on the fifth floor of hell. Sure. None of the pens work. The coffee machine has been out of order for a century and the only drink on offer is Jägermeister, but Pay has a plan and all he needs is one last member of the Harrison family to sell their soul. When the Harrisons retreat to the family lake house for the summer with their daughter Mickey's precious new friend Ruth in tow, the opportunity Pay has waited a millennium for might finally be in his grasp. And with the help of his charismatic co-worker Calamity, he sets a plan in motion. But things aren't always as they seem on earth or in hell. And as old secrets and new dangers scrape away at the Harrison's shiny surface, revealing the darkness beneath, everyone must face the consequences of their choices. I think it sounds fun. I don't think I've heard really good things about it, <laughs> but I think it sounds kind of fun. The last one from Half Price Books is The God of Endings by Jacqueline Holland. I've seen this quite a few times and I've been intrigued about it, but I didn't really know what it was about until I finally saw it. It says, Colette is a lonely artist who heads an elite fine arts school for children in upstate New York. It's always New York. Why is it always New York? <laughs> her youthful beauty masks the dark truth of her life. She has endured centuries of turmoil and heartache in the wake of her grandfather's long ago decision to make her immortal like himself. Now in 1984, Colette finds her life upended by the arrival of a gifted child from a troubled home, the return of a stalking presence from her past and her own mysteriously growing hunger for blood. Combining brilliant prose with breathtaking suspense, Jacqueline Holland serves a larger exploration of the human condition in all its complexity, asking us the most fundamental question, is life in this world a gift? or a curse. I love that. Sounds like vampires are coming into play, obviously, if you're picking up what she's putting down, which I'm definitely into. I love the like final, like almost philosophical question that we are now left with wondering. It definitely makes me want to pick it up for sure. All right, this last little stack, we're going to go through pretty quick. All right, I need to go lay down. <laughs> Sometimes I'll stop at the local Goodwill just when I feel like there might be a good book in the like stacks that they have. And I did find Ancillary Justice by Anne Leckie recently. It is the first in the Imperial Reach trilogy and it's won a bunch of awards. It's a sci-fi space opera and I'm not often in a sci-fi mood, but I feel like I would be really excited to try this. My most recent book of the month decisions was Anita DeMonte Laughs Last by Xochitl Gonzalez. This was one of the books in my spring releases video that I talked about and now I have it. It is about a first generation Ivy League student who who uncovers the genius work of a female artist decades after her suspicious death. And she starts to find a lot of similarities between the happenings of this older artist's suspicious death and what she's currently living. And it gets a little weird. And it says it moves back and forth through time and told from perspectives of both women. Like, I love that. I'm really excited to pick this one up. Then I also got Shark Heart, a love story by Emily Habick. It's a novel of marriage, motherhood, and metamorphosis of letting go. This intergenerational love story begins with newlyweds Ren and her husband, Louis, a man who over the course of nine months transforms into a great white shark. It's giving night bitch and it's giving our wives under the sea, perhaps. Have I even read the whole synopsis to make that comparison valid? No, not really. <laughs> but immediately, that's what I feel like. And I love magical realism. So as soon as I found out that that was actually integrated within this story, I'm for sure going to pick this up soon. I love how that sounds. Then we have three special editions. We'll start with the Invocations by Crystal Sutherland. This sprayed edge is one, I love that. I love that a lot. I wish the actual book was bigger, but it's fine. Inside is really pretty. The naked hardcover, stunning, stunning. This is the same author that wrote House of Hollow and I really loved the horror elements that she brought into that story, like the body horror, phenomenal, loved it. So I'm excited to pick this one up. This one says, five women are dead. The killer leaves no fingerprints, no DNA. Police are utterly stumped. In a world where only women can use magic and the men who know about it seek to eradicate them, three damaged young women, one cursed, one hunted, and one out for revenge, will team up to track down and take out a brutal supernatural killer. Okay. So it said five women are dead, right? And at the end, it says at the apartment of the fifth victim, Jude and Zara meet by chance and there they find a clue that brings their paths crashing together. A strange business card bearing three words, Emmer, Brian, curse writer. Maybe that's the other person. Maybe that's how the trio meets. Who knows? We're gonna find out. Next, we have A Fate Inked in Blood by Danielle L. Jansen. This is that romanticy book that is taking the world by storm. It is so beautiful. I don't even know if you can see it with this glare, but it's really stunning. Like I said, it's a romanticy. It has Norse mythology. Beautiful. Ah, 
A woman blessed by the gods battles to unite a nation under a power-hungry king while also fighting her growing desire for his fiery son <laughs> in this Norse-inspired fantasy romance. Very fun. I've really heard nothing but good things about this one, so I was very excited that this was in my subscription box. <laughs> Finally, last one, we have The City of Stardust by Georgia Summers. For centuries, Everleys have seen their brightest and best disappear, taken as punishment for a crime no one remembers for a purpose no one understands. Their tormentor is a woman named Penelope who never ages, never grows sick, and never forgives a debt. 10 years ago, Violet Everly's mother left to break the curse and never returned. Now Violet must find her mother or she will be taken in her place. Her hunt leads her into a seductive, magical underworld of power-hungry scholars, fickle gods, and monsters bent on revenge, and into the path of Penelope's quiet assistant, Alexander, who she knows cannot be trusted and yet to whom she finds herself undeniably drawn. <laughs> Tied to a very literal deadline, Violet will travel to the edges of the world to find her mother and the key to the city of Stardust where the Everly story began. Ah. This book sounds like it has a lot of different elements that I could enjoy. I have never heard of it before it showed up on my doorstep and I am looking forward to it. I do have another little pile over there accumulating. So there will be another book haul video soon, but I'm not joining it with this one and you'll understand why later. <laughs> but for this book haul, it has come to a close. Thank you so much for being here and hanging out with me for a little bit. If you are still watching, then leave me the B emoji down below in the comments if you have nothing else to say. I'll see you soon in the next video. And until then, be kind to one another and happy reading. Bye!